thanks very much, uh, uh, Mary uh, and Adam. Um, thank you to the Australian and uh, New Zealand Intensive Care Society uh, for inviting me here to speak. It's a real honour. Um, to talk about cell therapy for uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which has been building towards a, a clinical trial for the last 10 years. So I'd like to talk about that journey and the possibility of making this therapy a, a useful option for everyday treatment in patients with uh, ARDS. So in terms of my talk outline, I'll speak briefly about MSCs, what they are, and the initial rationale for preclinical testing of uh, MSCs in ARDS, which emerged from animal and human work in other areas. I'll outline some of this preclinical work, including my own, that has led to clinical trials. And finally, I want to talk about the things we don't know about MSCs and how this has implications for clinical translation. But first, uh, a salutary tale, because we need salutary tales to keep us awake when some Irish guy's going on about basic science work in stem cells. So I knew that Adam would get excited when I put up a picture of a sheep, but um, this is no ordinary sheep. This is Dolly, uh, a female domestic sheep and the first mammal to be cloned from an adult somatic cell using the process of uh, nuclear transfer by uh, Ian Wilmot and his group in the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh. So she was born in uh, 1996, and she lived for five years, um, or six years, at which point she died from a progressive lung disease. So the technique was called somatic cell nuclear transfer. You take a cell nucleus from an adult cell, transfer it into an unfertilized oocyte that has its nucleus removed, and then the hybrid cell is stimulated to divide. Uh, with an electric shock, and when it develops into a blastocyst, it's implanted into a surrogate mother. So other animals had been cloned before. Um, frogs were cloned as early as 1952. And once the scientists at the Roslyn had cracked mammalian cloning with Dolly, we got Elsie the cow from New Zealand, a cat called, very originally, Copy Cat, um, Ralph the rat, even Snuppy the puppy, um, after Dolly, scientists envisaged a, an industry of cloning applications, uh, like the production of medicines in live animals or clone transgenic pigs that could be used as organ donors. But that didn't and it will not come to pass. And most companies set up to commercialize cloning have shut down. So why? And what lesson does this have for cell therapy? Well. For one thing, the process is incredibly inefficient. Uh, Dolly was the only lamb born from 277 cloned embryos, uh, which is far below the efficiency required for industry. The second and probably the biggest obstacle was public and political opposition to therapeutic cloning because it creates, manipulates, and, and destroys human embryos for scientific ends. And this is exemplified in, in Kashio Shiguro's novel and the film Never Let Me Go, which was about a boarding school cut off in the English countryside in which pupils were ultimately organ donors or spare parts for original clones. And this idea is part of the reason that therapeutic cloning didn't ever get the support it needed to become clinically relevant. So some of the stem cell types suffer from this and other problems. There's a hierarchy of stem cells, not all stem cells are created equally. Basically, there's more stemness associated with embryonic stem cells, while so-called adult stem cells are more differentiated and they're less able to morph into any tissue type. So embryonic stem cells have had the most hype and they've probably had the most problems associated with them, including immune rejection, tumor formation, and difficulty with scaling production to what would be required for human cell therapy. Uh, on the other hand, stem cells from the bone marrow are among the best characterized and tested cells. So this includes hematopoietic stem cells, endothelial progenitor cells, and mesenchymal stem or stromal cells. And these have become the focus of basic and now clinical research in ARDS, and will hopefully become the first cellular therapeutics that we will see for critically ill patients. So where do they come from? The initial description of mesenchymal stem cells is attributed to a Russian scientist, Alexander Friedenstein. He was commissioned by the Russian government to study therapies for radiation-induced uh, bone marrow failure uh, during the Cold War. 
And he noticed that there was a spindle-shaped plastic adherent cell in the marrow that supported hematopoiesis, supported cell growth in the marrow, and that these cells had a high proliferative potential. They grew very fast when plated, and they could form bone. Subsequently, it was shown that these cells are present in other tissue, most notably adipose tissue and umbilical cord, and also that these cells can differentiate into cartilage and fat. Um, in trying to characterize MSCs, it is realized that they express low levels of HLA antigens and thus more or less evade uh, uh, recognition by uh, adaptive immunity. Um, these cells are characterized more by what they are not. They're not hematopoietic stem cells, they're not monocytes. Um, and there is no one marker that identifies what an MSC, and we still rely on plastic adherence uh, to identify them, which is a bit of a problem. So it was the observation that MSCs support uh, cell growth in the marrow that led to the first clinical trial of MSCs in the mid-1990s. It was a phase one trial of autologous MSCs in patients undergoing uh, autologous hematic stem cell transplantation for hematologic malignancy. So after they demonstrated safety in uh, this trial by Arnold Kaplan and, and Herbert Lazarus, they uh, performed a phase two trial in an effort to show that co-infusion of MSCs with uh, hematopoietic stem cells could hasten stem cell engraftment. Um, and the notion was, was based on the idea that's, that MSCs home to the marrow space and then they rebuild the microenvironment. Um, so based on, on this idea uh, that MSCs can, once injected, can go to the bone marrow and that they can differentiate into bone, at least in vitro, uh, Prokop went on to show that uh, MSCs could engraft in a mouse model of osteogenesis imperfecta and then the first clinical trial of allogeneic MSCs, that's MSCs from uh, an unrelated donor, uh, were used for osteogenesis imperfecta. So what did we learn from these trials? Well, um, as well as encouraging uh, engraftment of hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow, um, there was also a decreased incidence of graft-versus-host disease. And this arises because MSCs have um, a, uh, an immunomodulatory uh, effect. Uh, that is to say, they suppress activated T lymphocytes, they increase the uh, number of T regulatory lymphocytes, they reduce B, B lymphocyte proliferation, uh, natural killer cells, maturation of dendritic cells, etc. So, since acute graft versus host disease is a T cell mediated process, it was proposed that MSCs could be used potentially as a therapeutic modality here. And Katharina LaBlanc um, <coughs> used MSC infusion for a nine year old boy who had received a HLA matched unrelated donor HSC transplant but had developed severe graft versus host disease. And the patient got better. And uh, this was followed by other studies in uh, graft versus host disease, um, showing better survival and reduced incidence of uh, GVHD. So it's time for another salutary tale, because I can see everyone's eyes are glazing over with talk of CD markers and uh, secreted factors. So the, the cardiologists are never ones to wait long to test a potential therapy, and they felt they were being left behind. So this study appeared in Nature in 2001. It's from New York Medical College. It was a landmark murine study in which bone marrow derived cells, so that is to say um, just undifferentiated cells in the bone marrow which contain MSCs but also uh, endothelial progenitor cells and uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So just bone marrow mononuclear cells, they were administered by direct intramyocardial injection into infarcted murine hearts and the uh, transplanted cells underwent transdifferentiation. Uh, directly into cardiomyocytes and supporting vasculature, and they improved LV function. So that was good, and the ink wasn't dry in this mouse study when a wave of clinical trials using bone marrow mononuclear cells for cardiac regeneration ensued. And the first of these appeared only months after the original Nature publication. So subsequent to this, uh, many groups were unable to replicate the findings of this preclinical study, 
and it's now generally believed that trans differentiation of bone marrow cells does not uh, occur to cardiomyocytes to any meaningful degree. Um, the NIH funded something called the Cardiovascular Cell Therapy Research Network, which was mandated to conduct clinical trials and get them all done in five years' time. Um, so uh, three trials, uh, time, late time, and focus, um, looked at uh, LV function uh, and mortality uh, three and seven days after myocardial infarction. So other studies uh, together, there's about 2,000 subjects have received bone marrow mononuclear cells for cardiac dysfunction, and the pooled results suggest that the treatment appears to be safe, but clinical imp improvements are uh, certainly modest with this meta-analysis from this year in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology suggesting an improvement in ejection fraction of 3.5% which is not earth-shattering. So what about the lung? So there was much interest in the idea that mesenchymal stem cells could form, as well as bone cartilage and fat, could transdifferentiate into epithelial cells. And Julie Diane Krauss uh, reported in Cell that male MSCs injected into uh, irradiated female mice and using fluorescent uh, labeling of the Y chromosome uh, she found them in epithelial tissues, reported a 20% engraftment of bone marrow cells uh, in the lung. But, like the cardiologists, uh, nobody else could replicate these findings, and they were rejected. And it's now generally accepted that MSCs do not make lung cells to any significant degree. But they do tend to work. And the first report of MSCs in lung injury was from Maurizio Rojas's group in Atlanta who observed reduced inflammation and fibrosis and increased survival in a, a bleomycin model of uh, lung injury. So wait a minute, I hear you say, not another immunosuppressive therapy. Richard Hotkiss has done a good job in illustrating the reason why so many immunosuppressive therapies have failed in sepsis and perhaps in ARDS and lead to death in this hypoimmunity phase of critical illness. And we don't want another line on this table of ineffective pharmacologic therapies for ARDS. So here's what I think is different about MSCs. Uh, MSCs improve physiologic function by enhancing tissue repair and edema clearance. They reduce damaging inflammation, but they do this in a manner which maintains the host response to infection. They may even enhance bacterial clearance. And they secrete factors into the injury microenvironment, depending on the stage of injury inflammation and uh, repair that uh, can enhance uh, alveolar uh, capillary barrier function. So MSCs are promising. And as I said, not for their ability to form lung cells, but for the potential to repair the injured lung. So um, this is kind of a summary of our work, which I'll talk about uh, they can secrete cytokines and growth factors that are capable of modulating the immune response and also of repairing damaged epithelium and endothelium. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, they can be expanded in culture from 1 million harvested cells to up to 50 million that can be used therapeutically. And they have low expression of HLA antigens with the result that they do not have to be tissue matched for use in humans without the potential for allorejection. Very importantly, we do not have people waving banners saying, down with this sort of thing. There is public and political support for this work. And these factors make MSCs ideal as a cell therapy. So the person who's done most in terms of advancing mesenchymal stem cells towards clinical testing is Michael Mathe at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, he's put nearly 10 years of preclinical investigation into the potential of MSCs for ARDS, which has culminated in a clinical trial. So around that time that Michael was embarking on this work, he had a, a young ambitious researcher in his lab who was convinced that beta agonists were the answer for ARDS. His name was uh, Macaulay. So Michael came to Danny and offered him the MSC project saying, I, I think this might really work. I'm paraphrasing here, but his response was along the lines of stem cells for ARDS. That's ridiculous. It'll never catch on. I'm glad to see that the Rising Star program has improved this year, uh, the quality of the uh, people. 
Michael pushed on anyway, and he got Naveen Gupta to give MSCs intratracheally to mice that had been given large doses of intratracheal endotoxin, and he showed a survival benefit from MSCs, and this was accompanied by a reduction in histologic lung injury and increased water clearance. In a more clinically relevant model, he later showed that survival benefit occurred in mice who were actually infected with the bacteria E. coli. And Michael has also pioneered the use of the ex vivo perfused human lung to test potential therapies for ARDS. And it allowed him <clears throat> to test human MSCs in a human model of ARDS. So these are lungs that have been rejected for transplant because, as we know, the criteria for donor lungs are uh, quite stringent. In the ex vivo model, a single lung left or right is ventilated with CPAP and perfused in, in this particular experiment uh, from Jay Lee with blood and albumin. Uh, LPS is given to the lung to injure it, and later human MSCs are added uh, intrabronchially or uh, into the perfusate. So the principal measure of lung injury in this model is something called alveolar fluid clearance, the ability of the lung to clear water from the airspace. So MSCs are MSC condition medium, that is medium that has been exposed to MSCs and therefore contains MSC secreted factors, improved alveolar fluid clearance in this model. And they were able to show that this beneficial effect was down to the secretion of uh, a growth factor by knocking out keratinocyte growth factor using, using small interfering RNAs. Uh, and then the beneficial effect was lost and it was a beneficial effect that was accompanied by um, alterations in histology and uh, in uh, inflammatory cell infiltration. So this is the model of the human lung. Uh, uh, it is something that is useful to test ARDS therapies in by injuring the lung with LPS or bacteria, but also as a means to test therapies to repair lungs that have been rejected for transplantation. This is the ex vivo lung perfusion model we work with in Toronto. Uh, we're trying to repair the marginal donor human lung, that is the lung that's not quite suitable for transplantation. So Danny and I spent another year in Michael's lab looking at ways to use MSCs to improve lungs that had baseline poor alveolar fluid clearance. Uh, so we showed that human MSCs can improve alveolar fluid clearance in these uh, very injured lungs, in fact. And we showed that this effect was dependent on KGF secretion by the MSCs themselves. So when Michael Mathe went to the FDA to uh, get uh, an investigational new drug application, they were happy with the preclinical studies, but they were worried about safety in this population of very sick patients. So they asked for a large animal study, so uh, Michael undertook a study in Dan Traber's lab in Galveston in Texas in his cottonwood smoke pseudomonas model of ARDS. Um, he demonstrated safety, um, no alterations in systemic arterial blood pressure, in particular no change in pulmonary arterial uh, blood pressure, which was uh, a, a concern and improvements in oxygenation with the use of both high and low dose uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Interestingly, he only showed with high dose uh, MSCs that there was a, a reduction in uh, pulmonary edema. So we've also been studying these cells for the past six years. Um, our first studies were in a model of repair from ventilator-induced lung injury where we used multiple doses of MSCs or their conditioned medium and compared these to uh, fibroblasts and looked at injury and repair over uh, 48 hours. So in animals who had received MSCs, functional parameters were improved, such as uh, alveolar arterial oxygen gradients and respiratory static compliance. And this was through a combined effect of improved water clearance and uh, reduced inflammation, which is evident in this slide. Uh, MSCs were very effective at altering the uh, inflammatory cell infiltration in the lung and, and producing the more normal macrophage predominant picture uh, below and effectively blocking neutrophil entry into the alveolus. Um, so MSCs themselves enhanced recovery, but so too did their secreted factors. Um, 
and uh, so too that their secreted factors have the similar effect on uh, uh, inflammation. So we uh, looked at wound repair at an in vitro level. Um, we uh, seeded alveolar epithelial cells in 96 well plates and uh, formed scratch wounds um, and exposed these scratch wounds to different conditions. Um, including MSE condition medium and the cells themselves. And we showed that wound closure was uh, better in the groups that were exposed to MSEs, and this effect was uh, partially uh, reduced by the elimination of keratinocyte growth factor. We've also looked at uh, different doses and different routes of administration of uh, MSEs, and um, in, in summary, intratracheal or intravenous route of administration both uh, results in uh, similar effects, um, despite a fairly uh, transient presence of the MSCs in the lung. They're, they're pretty much gone after 24 hours. They're chewed up by the reticular endothelial system. So uh, it's well and good testing rat MSCs in rats, but human MSCs are somewhat different, certainly in the manner in which they uh, alter uh, inflammation. So uh, our lab looked at uh, human MSCs in this model and did some dose response experiments and showed similar effects in terms of repair and inflammation. And we also looked at human MSCs in uh, an E. coli pneumonia, pneumonia model. And what's interesting is that <clears throat> even though human MSCs, uh, you're administering human MSCs to a rat, these cells don't need, these animals don't need to be immunosuppressed. Um, traditionally, when uh, we give syngeneic uh, cells to uh, mice or rats, we use uh, nude mice, but uh, this isn't required because of the low levels of uh, HLA antigens that are expressed on MSCs. And of course, uh, if we are going to move to a clinical trial, the European Medic Medicines Agency and um, the uh, uh, Health Canada require that you're going to test the actual product uh, that is going to be used in humans, in animals. So um, these studies go uh, partially uh, away towards doing that, showing similar effects on, uh, on measures of physiology. And um, what's interesting in the pneumonia model is that we need much higher doses to uh, attain a, a therapeutic effect. and. Uh, it, it's been consistent in studies that uh, MSCs have reduced bacteria uh, in either polymicrobial sepsis or uh, in pneumonia, uh, but you require quite high doses to do that, which is a concern. And of course, this, this has been replicated in uh, studies by my uh, colleagues in St. Mike's, Duncan Stewart and Shirley Mai. So all of this preclinical work is very convincing and it provides a strong rationale for clinical testing. But there remains much that m should make a stop and think carefully about how much we know and how much we don't know about MSCs and ARDS, enough to at least make us cautious about how we should proceed. We don't really know exactly how MSCs work. Michael's group and our group have focused on keratinocyte growth factor, and it's no doubt important for MSC therapeutic effect. But it's only one factor, and it may not be the most important one. We have cell-dependent effects, and we have effects from a variety of secreted factors, including uh, IL-1 or A, angiopoietin, transforming growth factor beta, and there's a lot more. Christina Nemeth's uh, seminal study gave MSCs to mice with polymicrobial sepsis and demonstrated better survival in the MSC group associated with an effect on macrophage to secrete more IL-10 and decrease lung and systemic TNF and IL-6. But then along comes another seminal study showing that MSCs transfer their mitochondria via gap junctions, uh, connexin 43, to rescue epithelial cells that have been injured by LPS. And then when you get rid of this effect, you lose the therapeutic effect in LPS. But that can't be right because Darwin Prockett's group have focused on an anti-inflammatory protein called TNF-stimulated gene 6 protein, TSG6, and they've shown that in MI models and in LPS injury, TSG6 is the important MSC secreted factor. 
In reality, MSEs have many effects that depend not only on the cell itself, but also on the disease state into which they, they are introduced. If they're introduced into a pro-inflammatory state, they appear to reduce innate and cellular immunity. They also encourage tissue repair, and they do this through a variety of mechanisms. But then the cells themselves are a heterogeneous population. One cell might be in a different state of differentiation to another. Cells from different donors are different. Cells from different sources are different. So is it really important that we have a measure of potency in these cells, or is it enough to say that they work? I'm afraid it is, because if we're going to measure effect in early phase clinical trials, we have to have something to measure. The potency of the cells is important, and so is some measure of biochemical effect in the host patient. Uh, this study in the Blue Journal this year is indicative. Cells from aged mice are not as effective as cells from young mice in ameliorating LPS-induced lung injury, and the same is true of <coughs> cells from uh, patients who have disease. They are different. Cells from fat may be the most immunologically active, but we're not sure yet. And then there's a whole pre-activation story. Um, when you inject cells into a certain microenvironment, they become more active. So there's the idea that we can make a cell pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, depending on what you stimulate the cell with. So manipulation of this kind of system might have the potential to augment host defense. Uh, this is work from our lab showing that if you expose MSCs to TNF or LPS, they have a very different secretory profile than naive cells. Um, we can make cells secrete more keratinocyte growth factor by growing them in hypoxic environments, and we can make them grow faster uh, by uh, growing them in 4% oxygen too. And we believe that getting cells to stay in the lung for a period of time is important to therapeutic effect. So we have used microfluidics devices to look at labeled cells on the endothelium to try and encourage cells to bind and traverse, so as they would do in the alveolus if they were given systemically. And this is a picture of some of our labeled cells and microvascular endothelium. An increase in macrophage phagocytosis is one consistent effect we have seen when we expose MSCs to macrophage. As you can see in this live microscopy video of uh, a macrophage trying to engulf uh, strep pneumonia, um, it's pretty amazing how tenacious it is. There's different responses to this video. People say, oh, it's amazing uh, how the macrophage continues to go after him. And other people say, but look at the strep pneumonia in the corner of the screen. He's getting away. And other people say, that's not strep pneumonia. <laughs> um, anyway. We've shown that macrophage um, that have been exposed to MSCs engulf bacteria more efficiently than MSCs that have not, and that this effect, and this is early work, is true, an enhancement of the FC gamma immunoglobulin phagocytosis pathway. And of course, MSCs seem to alter macrophage phenotype. And these macrophage seem to kill bacteria faster. They're a more anti-inflammatory macrophage, but when the, bu the bug gets inside the cell, uh, the phagolysosome acidifies more rapidly and it kills the bacteria quicker. So Danny delights in showing this uh, paper. It was in PNAS last year. It created a storm when it described mouse work as being entirely useless as a surrogate for human disease. So that's probably not entirely true, but there's no doubt that there's no substitute for clinical testing. So how should we move forward? MSCs have shown their safety profile having been administered to thousands of patients with cardiovascular and uh, hematologic diseases over the last two decades. Maybe we should start doing phase one and two studies, but these need to be coupled with careful mechanistic studies in humans to determine activity, potency, and the most important therapeutic effects. Uh, this is the NIH-approved funding for uh, an open-label escalation, uh, dose escalation study of MSCs for moderate to severe uh, ARDS that uh, Michael's got. It's uh, being run by UCSF in five centers. The phase one is finished and uh, the phase two is ongoing and its uh, principal uh, aim is to evaluate safety. They're using cells from the University of Minnesota Production Assistance for Cell Therapy program. Um, they're using different doses and uh, the primary endpoints, as I said, are safety. Uh, this is another trial led by a less well-known group in China using adipose-derived MSCs 
which was published this year, um, they only used 12 patients and they demonstrated safety only and no uh, physiologic or biochemical effect. And Duncan Stewart in Ottawa is undertaking a similar study of MSCs for sepsis called a KISS or uh, cellular immunotherapy for septic shock. And that study is in the optimization phase. They still haven't recruited any patients. So finally, if all else fails, MSCs should keep us looking younger. So I'll finish there and uh, with thanks to uh, Anzix, uh, to you for coming and uh, listening to me go on, and to uh, all in my group uh, back in Toronto and all the people I collaborate with. Thank you very much.